he may be able to preach boldly out of your word and edify the congregation. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. There's, there are some people today who just debate and argue about everything, aren't there? They just debate, they just debate everything. They, they argue whether, whether Ford is Betty or better or Chevy. Right? And it, it depends. It depends if you're looking for a car or you're looking for a truck. It doesn't matter. I mean, everybody knows that Dodge has the best. But, um, you know, there's Coke and Pepsi. Everybody's got a question over Coke and Pepsi. Giants or Cowboys, you know, has that argument going on. Patriots against, doesn't matter. They're always the best. Um, Republican versus Democrat is always out there as well. NASCAR versus Indy. There's always debates back and forth of everything we do. Now, if you're asking Brother Ed, I'll tell you where Brother Ed stands on all these issues, all right? Ed stands on Ford. He stands on Pepsi. And I don't know why, but he goes for the Browns. I don't know why. I don't exactly know why. He's, over, he's a diehard Indians fan. And then he's, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, he, he likes more NASCAR than Indy. I don't understand all why, but that's what he's all about, Formula One. But, you know, he doesn't like the Formula One. But there are some people all day who analyze, who, who they do nothing but analyze the uh, philosophy and political pat platforms of leaders. They're always on TV. You see them on Fox News, CNN, you know, a, um, and MSNBC, whatever it is. They sit, all they do is talk. That's all they do all day is just talk about their ideas and their philosophies. Um, they just talk about what they think is going to happen next or what Trump should have done or what Clinton didn't do or what Obama said, you know, what, da 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 Always just yeah. one thing after another. There are people who follow creed and ceremony. There's people who they follow after what they believe and what they, you know, they're, they're what they, they're saying what they believe and how they do things. There, there are wars that are waged on differences of religion, <coughs> denominations, religious practices and affiliation. There's war nonstop. We're always going to have war. It's just going to be. Um, you know, the Bible says from whence comes wars and rumors of wars that come from what? Our flesh. They come from our lust. It comes from our greed. Can I tell you, there's nothing more evident in revealing, there's nothing more evident in revealing the truth in what, than what is already given, and that's the word of God. My interpretation of scripture doesn't change. This is why it's so important for us when we talk to people, when we talk to people, to have the Bible. And not just memorize the Bible, but to have a Bible present. I was door knocking recently, and a man went to the door, and he just had a track. And he, he, he witnessed someone out of a track. Look, we have a more sure word of prophecy than just being, and it is the word of God in the track. But we have a Bible. If you've got to use your Bible, show them from the word of God. It's not yeah. your ideas. It's not cut and pasted what we want. It's all from the word of God. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter number 4, go there if you would. You're, you're right there, one page over. So go to um, a couple pages, if you're, depending on how your Bible's laid out. But Hebrews chapter number 4, verse 12, the Bible says we have something that's just plain better. And that's the title of today's sermon, is just plain better. There are things that are just, it's not what I'm better than you are, what you're better than me, or anything. It's just the Bible is just plain better. The things of God are just plain better. Amen? And we're going to look at that idea today. It says here in Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword, Amen. piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is neither any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened into the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There is no blind justice with God. God sees everything that we do. Right. God knows all that goes on. And we're not bound. God is not going to be taken by surprise. We don't have an impartial judge. We don't have a partial judge. We have an impartial judge. He judges us according to the word of God. Aren't you glad for that? It's not by my whims or your whims or what one person views about God or the other person views. People think that, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a Christian God and there's a, that there's a Christian God and there's a Muslim God. Let me tell you something. There's only one true God, and that's the God of the Bible. Yeah. That's the God of heaven. That's my God that I serve. There's only one true God. I'm glad today that God, was, that God has made his word available in the English language. I'm glad that we hold a copy of his holy, of his holy word in our hands today. I'm glad I don't have to go to some college or university to learn a foreign dead language to try to understand it. I'm glad I've got the word of God in English today. I don't have to go to the Greek and Hebrew to understand what God is saying today. I was talking to someone recently, and they were like, well, the Greek and Hebrew, it says this. And I'm like, you don't even read Greek and Hebrew. You can barely speak English. Well, I've got a strong concordance. I'm like, that's not, not the same thing. I'm glad I don't have to go to some dead language and try transposing it to some 
to some, you know, to some other language and try to compare it against each other. I'm glad I have some of what God has for me today. I'm glad I have a God who says, I'm going to judge you according to the Word of God, and I'm going to give you the Word of God to be judged out by. Amen. God gives us an open book test. He wants us to have the Word of God. Right. He wants us to have it. If you're here today and you don't have the Word of God, let me know, and I will get you a copy Amen. of the Word of God. Amen. We all have to have the Word of God. We ought to be reading the Word of God. We ought to be hearing the Word of God. We ought to be about the Word of God. It, because it's, That's how we're going to be judged accordingly. We ought to talk to each other out of the Word of God. We ought to share things from the Word of God. The Word of God is our textbook. It's our manual. It's our FOP. It's our rule book. It's our guidebook. It's our book. Uh, it's a book we can go to when we're for leisure. It's a place where we go for a law, for what God wants from us. The Word of God is our truth, is our source for truth. I'm glad that His Word will reveal the importance from the, from what is important from what is unimportant. So many today will make will make a stand on what is unimportant. They'll they'll go on and they'll they'll argue to the point of ridiculousness of things that are just not important to divide over. There are some things that are just not worth dividing over. And some people make it a bone of contention to argue over those things. I am glad that we don't have to worry about those. I am important. I'm, I'm glad that his word reveals um, the wonderful truth of God, who God is, what he is, and what he cannot do, what he has done, and what he'll continue to do. God tells us all about the things of God. We don't have to wonder what God... God's not my whim. God's not my interpretation. God is not relevant to my thoughts. You know, it's not God, it's God's being is not relevant to my thoughts as far as I don't make right. God what I want Him to be. I don't chisel off a piece of God over here and apply it to this over here. No, God is who He is, and I'm supposed to measure up what He wants me to be. Amen. I'm, glad that, I'm glad that His Word reveals to me my sin. Have you ever done it? you know... Have you ever done any something in something in complete ignorance and you didn't know about it? I remember when I was a kid, we uh, we went to this youth conference in uh, in uh, New York, and the, they had a Bible trivia contest, like a Bible trivia. Remember back in the day, they had the tri like geography bowls. Does anyone besides me remember those things? Annoying as all get out. That's pretty bad. The only person to raise their hand is like a little bit older than I am. But I was like, <laughs> um. Uh, spelling bees. Well, we had a Bible bee. And all, all, these, all these churches got together for this Bible trivia contest. And I was like 11 and a half years old. I wasn't even 12 yet. I wasn't even supposed to be in the, in the, in the teen department. But because my dad was a chaperone, I got to go. And I entered into the contest. And I smoked everybody in my church. I mean, I whooped everybody in Bible trivia. And there was about 40 kids, one of, you know, Couple more missionaries, and I just like obliterated them, man. I just let them have it. Let her, lowered the gun and blasted it out. I was like, so I was like, man, I'm, I'm it, man. I am it. And it was me and this other, and this, and this pastor's daughter, 17 years old. It was just me and her in the finals. Because the other guy in my church, I black, I was like triple his score. He, had, he was like insignificant, but he, he just stood there. He just stood there making, you know, looking, making faces at the girls. We just, we, we. It was crazy. I was whooping the 17-year-old college, you know, the 17-year-old pastor's daughter. I was, I was going at it, man. I was going 11 and a half years old. You understand, 11 and a half years old, beating a 17-year-old in Bible trivia. We're talking about some major breakthrough here. We're talking about the upset of the century. I'm just letting you know this is going to work out. It's going to be good. The question was asked. It was a, it was a daily double. You know, you, you get the wager. I wagered a big chunk of my, of how much I had. I, we, I, I, I bet a bunch of my stuff off. And then my point's off, and he said, okay, here's the question. What did Noah make the ark out of? Now, I listened. I have paid attention to junior church. <laughs> the Lord told Noah to build him an arky, arky. Lord told Noah to build him an arky, arky. Build it out of gopher barky, barky. That was my answer. I knew it so confident. <laughs> Rang in, gopher barky, barky. <laughs> Everybody laughed. My self-esteem went out the window. Everybody laughed at me. I was so nervous. I was so embarrassed. I was so ashamed of myself. I lost my edge. I lost to a girl. I came in second place, and I lost to a girl. The answer is not... Jeff? Did you walk by? Okay. The answer, the answer, was, not, the answer was not go for Barky. The answer is shit him, Woody. Yeah. But I answered, go for Barky Barky. This is why you don't get your theology from songs. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed by it. And I, I just lost my edge. 
I was so I thought I had it so right, but I'm glad the Bible tells us when I do something in complete ignorance. I went that day and I searched my Bible front and back to find out what it was, and the answer was Shittim wood. And I was so embarrassed. And then later on I found out it's also known as gopher wood. I was right the whole time, but I couldn't defend myself. I was 11 and a half, and I was so scared. But I'm glad the Bible, can, we can go back to the Bible, and we think we're right. Well, we think we're right. We can still find out, hey, the Bible is always true, and it's always there. Aren't you glad for that? Ever, have you ever been right sometimes, and you didn't know you're right, but then you found out you're wrong, and then you found out you're really right? Anybody like that before? Husbands, we understand that means. <laughs> Verse, have you ever realized you built your entire premise on fallacy? You build an entire doctrine or entire premise on fallacy, on fallacy, on something that's not true, and you just sit back like, oh, I'm embarrassed. So let me, let me show you four things from the Bible, what God reveals. Let me show you, this is, why, this is why we have a better, this is why the Bible says that Christ is better. He's better than, he's better than Melchizedek. He's better than the Old Testament offerings. He's better than the Old Testament law. Amen? He is the high priest. His sacrifice is better. The sin sacrifice was better. He is better. And that's why we serve him, amen? But it says in number one, four things that God God's words reveals. And that is in Romans chapter number three, in verse number 23. We use this a lot when we're out sowing. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Ryan has a good illustration. He says, God's a standard, and the Bible says we fall short. You guys think I see fall short. That's kind of cool. <laughs> but it's like, you know, we always fall short. The Bible says in Romans chapter three, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says in verse number, uh, verse number eleven, there's none that understandeth. There's none that there, the gone, you know. There's none understandeth. The Bible says in verse number, verse number twelve, they're all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. I am glad that God shows us our condemnation. Have you ever been in trouble before? You did something wrong, and nobody ever told you you're doing something wrong before, and they just kind of let you go on by, and no one ever stopped and corrected you. And then you get back and you're like, oh, no one told me. If, I, if someone would have told me, I would have done it, you know, I would have done it differently. I had this shirt. I absolutely loved this shirt. It was a denim shirt. I loved it. But it just didn't button right. Like, the buttons, instead of, you know, you know guys, we have the shirt, right? But instead of the buttons being here, the button was here. <laughs> well, hold on. I love this shirt. It was my favorite shirt in the entire world. It was my, I mean, I loved it. It fit right on me. It looked good on me. Oh, I just, it was comfortable. It was it light and airy. It was, not, it was warm and it just felt good, you know? I told you not to say, I'm walking around with a girl shirt. And I thought it was a guy shirt, but it felt so good. My mom didn't notice it. My dad didn't. Nobody noticed it except my best friend growing up, Nathan Young. He never t he didn't tell me. He just like laughed and didn't tell me anything. He goes, oh, it's a nice shirt. I'm like, okay, thank you, you know? And then my mom, my, my button fell off, and my mom's sitting looking at it. She goes, something's not right about the shirt. I'm like, what do you mean? It's my favorite shirt. She goes, something's just not right about your shirt. I'm like, well, what is it? And she's like, oh. <laughs> All right, I want, I want to show you. I'm like, what? She goes, this is a girl shirt. I was so embarrassed again. Man, my life was full of embarrassment. I'm telling you. Right? You know the awkward teenager that does everything just is the geek and messed up? I was, no one ever told me. No one ever told me. But the Bible says, the Bible, and by the way, the Bible says, I want to throw this out there, men wearing women's, men wearing women's clothes and women wearing men's clothes an abomination. But here I am, they're, mocking, they're laughing at me, they're mocking because I didn't know, I did something so out of subtle ignorance, but I am so thankful that my mom was like, um, that shirt's a girl shirt. My friend, who knew, and he later on, he goes, yeah, I knew the girl shirt. I'm like, you, you knew it? You didn't tell me? What kind of friend are you, you know? But um, I'm so glad that God tells us where we are, where we stand. It is not unloving to tell someone we're sinners. It is actually more unloving not to tell someone they're sinners. You know, we go out and tell people, well, you know, well, you're just judging me because you, you don't think I'm... Look, we're, we, we need to share the gospel to a lost and dying world, not because we think we're better than them and yeah. shoving it down. We're letting them know, man, you're going to a devil's hell and you don't need to. Jesus Christ, you know, he, he shows us that we're sinners and that he, he, he died on the cross for us. Ephesians, I'm sorry, we are a fallen man. We are born sinners. The Bible says we're, we are a, a fallen man and we're sentenced to death and an everlasting destruction because of our sin. We have crimes against a holy God. 
We were born enemies because of our sin, because of our fallen nature. We are all we have all exercised our rebellion and crimes against God. We were without excuse. I read a verse, I can't remember where it was at, I should have underlined it, and I found it, and it said that we're that um our it talked about our sin nature, saying that basically man is born a few days, and I know there's one I'll quote it, but it says Man is born of a woman a few days and full of trouble. Right? I mean, a baby is full of trouble after you know after the first after the first couple little bit. He's they're, they're, what happens? They have a sin. They have a sin nature in them. Dwells no good thing. And because of our rebellion against God, God, we choose to sin against God. We choose to live that way because of our rebellion against God. And because of our um, uh, our sin against God, we refuse to seek reconciliation with God. The Bible says in chapter 3, verse 12 of Romans, it says, there's none that seeketh after God. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, it says this, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We're not seeking God. There's not a person out there seeking after God. God has to draw them, and God is drawing everyone, by the way. God is drawing everyone, but because of our rebellion towards God, we're not seeking after God. We don't like to retain God in our knowledge. And because people re refuse to return God in their knowledge, do you, how many sins are we one step away from becoming reprobate? How many sins are we from becoming reprobate? As unsaved world around us, that next door neighbor who's not saved, how many more sins, how, how far does he have to go in his sinful nature to become reprobate where God says no more? I don't know. We don't know. I don't know. God does. That's rough stuff. But because of our rebellion towards God, we refuse to, to seek reconciliation. God has set before us death and life, and we choose death. Without God, without God convicting us and showing us and bringing us to him, convincing him of our sin, we will not come to God by our own. We don't, how many times do you see people come to church because they want to get saved? Hardly ever. People usually come to church because we invite them. The only, really, the way we're supposed to go out and, and lead people to Christ is to go out to them and knock on their door Amen. and confront them where they are. Why? Because they're not seeking after God. They're not. They go to church because they want to feel good about themselves. So they checked off a religious thing off their notch, off their belt. But they're not seeking after God. Young people today are becoming more rebellious towards the things of God like ever before. Yeah. We were out door knocking um, in, on, th on Thursday, and brother and Ryan and I went up to this. We, we, let, we let a lady cross uh, right across the wave to her and then we went upstairs and came back down and there's a and there's a door over here we knocked on the door and I forgot the young man's name but we started talking about heaven and hell because I don't really believe we start Ryan started showing him from about verses about hell and he started laughing like something was funny because Ryan says is something funny I love it because Ryan's like he's like he's, he's like so polite you know you never Ryan's buddy like, is it something funny like what's up What's funny? He goes, oh, I just saw something on TV. But the whole time they're laughing and snickering and jeering. And then Ryan something realizes, okay, this guy doesn't believe in hell. This guy's mocking us. Have a good day and moves on. Yeah. But I was like, young people, he was what, maybe 18, maybe? He was young, young kid. Young people nowadays, oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an atheist. No, you're not. You don't even know what an atheist is. You're not an atheist. Right. Right. You're not a, these young people going to college, 16 or 14 years old, coming out and telling me, oh, yeah, I'm a lesbian. You're not a, you don't even know what a lesbian, you don't even know what a, you can't spell lesbian. <laughs> they don't know what they believe, but they're being taught this kind of stuff in college, in high school, oh, right. in grade school, in middle school. They're being taught this stuff on the internet. They're being taught this stuff on, on, in their music. They're being taught this kind of stuff in their games. There is no God. Oh, there is a God. Yeah. And we're going to stand and give account to him one day. But all these people just kind of go rapid on and on. And, well, there's no fear of God in their eyes. The Bible says it in Proverbs. There's no fear of God in their eyes. There's none. Look, this, the generation that we have today, it's, 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 it was bad in my generation. It was bad in some of y'all's generation. It's even more wicked in the generation coming up. These young kids growing up, we have no idea what culture. We, we got to get a grip on it. Go to, go to their classroom. Go to their school sometime. Sit in one of their classes. They're not being taught a world. You know what they're being taught? They're being, they're taught, being taught an atheist worldview, an agnostic worldview, right. that there is no God. You can't prove there's a God. And we can't figure it out. Let me tell you, the public school is no place for the public school is no place to have children go to go to college. I understand people have to. I understand, I understand the system we live in, but I'm telling you, the best place for a kid to learn is for mom and dad at home. That's the best place. Christian schools are even off the rock or crazy. Right. In the past 15 years, I've heard more scandals 
in Christian schools going on sex abuse in Christian schools, not in public schools. I would almost say that the Christian school is, is secondary to the public school. That's how whack it is. These teachers don't want to have to get up there and teach. Now, I'm not saying every public school teaches wrong, but I'm saying the majority of it does. The majority of it does. Parents, go, go to your kid's school sometime. You know, kid, you know go, go, down, go down there and talk to the school board sometime and see what they're teaching kids. The world does not want us, the world does not want us to, to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It just doesn't. We're messed up. But the Bible says, you know, because, we, you know, because of our rebellion, we deserve the wrath and judgment of God on us all. Go to Nahum chapter number 1. Nahum's in the Old Testament. I gotta sing the books of the Bible song until I find it. So <laughs> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you know, my Joshua, Judges. Nahum is somewhere back there. Only what, what like one chapter. This is embarrassing. The one verse I didn't print off. Found it. If you're there, say amen. 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 Look at verse number two. God is jealous and the lord revengeth the lord revengeth and is furious the lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies that's that's where god's at mm -hmm. that's what the bible says we deserve that because we are sinners and we've sinned against the holy righteous god and the bible says that he, that he reserveth his wrath for his enemies that's what we deserve. The Bible says in Psalms chapter number 79, verse 1. Let's turn there. Psalm 79, verse 1. I'm using my new, brand new, spanking new King James Bible today. New and King I'm, James? Yes, my new King James. <laughs> uh oh. Hey, Brother Tim, cut that up, okay? And put that on. All right. <laughs> oh God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. Where is that even talking about my reference at all? I have got no idea why that's in there. That's another verse I was looking for. Moving on. But the Bible talks about we have, we have sinned against the holy and righteous God. We deserve the wrath of God on us. We deserve the wrath of God. Um, verse number five. There you go. How long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee. And upon thy, the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. They're praying for God's wrath. And you know what? God's wrath is going to be poured out one day like never yeah. before. Yeah. And mankind is going to, you know what, even, even then, mankind is not going to look to, the, not look to the Lord. They're going to look upon the rocks and the hills and they're going to ask for them to fall on him to save them from him that sits upon the throne. They don't want to, they don't want to face God ever. They're not interested in facing God. They don't want to face God. They, they just want to uh, they want to live in God's world and not pay and not do what God wants for them. You know, face it, we're created with a purpose. We're, we are His creature. We are His creation. We're 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 made yeah. for a purpose, and we need to understand. We need to remind the world of that on a daily basis. What the world you know what the world needs to know. But you know, there's another thing the Bible reveals. The Bible reveals this. God God reveals God's um, condom, com, commendation, commend, not condemnation, commendation. Commend, commending, I can't say the word. <laughs> Number one is our condemnation. Number two is he commends us, our, you know, um, God's commendation. Romans chapter number five, in verses eight through ten, the Bible says for, um, um, Romans chapter eight, I'm in Hebrews, go to he Romans chapter eight, number eight. I am all messed up today with this new Bible. Romans chapter number five, verse number eight. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I love reading verses five, six, uh, verses six, and uh, when I go to the door and I'm reading this verse, I go back to verse number six. It says, "For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We couldn't save ourselves. We were hopeless, helpless, but right. Jesus Christ saved us. Amen. There's nothing I did to contribute to it. It's all what He's already done. I love that verse. But in verse number five, it's verse number eight. It says, um, "God commendeth His love toward us." You see, that's God's commending. His, his comm he comm He's commending His love toward us. And then in verse number 10, it says, uh, verse number 9, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from what? Wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. There's another verse talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ right there. You don't have to deviate 
from Romans chapter number 5, giving the gospel. Isn't that so cool? I love it. Anyways, but the Bible says that God loved us. That's enough said. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, that God loved us. John chapter 3, verses 3, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We know these verses. But here are some things. God loved us. That's enough said. The fact that God would love us, that says one thing. But here's another thing. We were deplorable, yet he loved us. We were sinners, yet he loved us. While we were yet in our sins, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's love. We were we wronged him, yet he wrought salvation's plan. We rebelled, yet he redeemed us. We sinned, yet he sacrificed for us. He sacrificed himself for us. That's grace. Grace is often an acronym, G-R-A-C-E. It stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. You know, that's mercy. That's love. That's what God did for us. That's what God showed us. We sinned against the holy and righteous God, but he took that pain. He took that punishment upon us. We sinned against him, but he sacrificed for us. And you know, we, can't, we can never get past that. We can never lose sight of that, that it's not about our good works, even after salvation. We're not sanctified by our good works. We're sanctified by his finished work on the, on the, you know, in the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're, we're risen with him. We're risen for him. Number three, I want to show you this. We see Christ's contradiction. What makes, what makes, God, what makes Christ so much better? What makes him so much better than, what we could, than the Old Testament law? Well, the Old Testament law, don't get me wrong, the law was, is still good. It brings us to show us that we need a Savior. Amen. You can't, you can't get a person lost without them realizing their sin, that they sinned against the holy and righteous God. People limit it to the Ten Commandments, but really it's like 613. And if you take away the ceremonial law and the dietary law, we still can't keep the Ten Commandments. We still can't give them a good life. It's not easy to live a good life. We can't do it on our own. We can't do it at all. We can't do it at all. Christ paid, the pay, the, Christ paid that payment. I was talking to Veronica, that lady yesterday, Veronica. And I was showing her from the gospel. I was showing her about Christ. I was showing her Christ paid it all. The wages of sin is what? It's death. The Bible says death passed upon us for all have sinned. Christ took our place on the cross. He died for us. When we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. And the Bible says that God commended his love toward us. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All the sins that we've ever committed, Christ paid for. And then I showed where Jesus went and suffered our place in hell. He took our punishment, our sin's punishment in hell. And her eyes, he got his biggest saucers, and she said, I never knew that. And I was like, honestly, that's, you know, this is why we know that Christ was buried. This is why Christ died, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day. We know that Christ went to hell and took our, took our payment. And because the payment was paid in full, Christ was risen again the third day, and he offers us eternal life. Amen. And I showed her plainly and said, what is left for us to do? Can you pay? She said, I can't pay God's sin debt. What is the only thing you can pay? She says, there's nothing I can pay. So what is it God requires? God requires faith. That's it, nothing more. And she still refused to believe. She still refused to come to Christ. Well, why? It's, all, it's always got to be about what she can do. It's all about what man can do. Always, man's always, she refused to surrender. She refused to repent of her dead work. She refused to repent of her, of her trusting in her own self. And that's sad. Because that way, if she doesn't come to Christ, she'll split hell wide open. That's sad. Go to Hebrews chapter number 12. I can't, I, whenever I share the gospel with someone, and I know it's... Whenever I share the gospel with someone and they don't get saved, the first couple minutes I sit back and say, did I do anything wrong? Did I say something wrong? Was I not crystal clear? Did I muddy up the gospel? Did I do anything at all? And sometimes I do. Sometimes I wasn't clear as I should have been. Sometimes I mess up. And sometimes I sit back and I realize, no, I was right. I did everything clear. That person just didn't believe. Yep. At that point, it just tears me up because it's nothing I messed up. At the end of the day, it's not. she's not trusting. She's not going to go to hell because I messed up the gospel. It's because she refused to take the simplicity that's in Christ. That is the heart. That's what I have. A, I, it tears me up every time. Because I'm like, I don't want to see that person go to hell. I don't want to see that person in hell for all eternity. Hebrews chapter number 12. You know, when was last, seriously, when was the last time we, we cried over our lost soul? When was the last time we wept? We like to go forth bearing precious seed, don't we? When was the last time we went forth weeping? What was the last time we had compassion? What was the last time we wept over the people that, you know, what was the last time we wept for the souls that we witnessed to? 
here's Christ's great contradiction. Sin has to be paid for. We know this, right? And this is what we share with people all the time. But this is what makes God, this is what makes Christ so, so much better than, than, any, than, than the Old Testament. It says this, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin with, ju- with doth so easily beset us. That's donuts. Verse number 12, it says, And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The author and finisher of our faith. It's completed in him. We are complete in him. It's finished in him. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. He became sin for us. The holy God took on our sin. The immortal became mortal. The invisible became seen. He took our flesh, he took our sins upon him, and he died. The great contradiction is that he became sin for us. Go to Hebrews chapter number 9. What made Christ so much better so much better of a high priest than Melchizedek? Because he offered once for all. He offered once for all. He offered himself a sin sacrifice because he was holy, blameless, sin, sinless, harmless, like it said in our text. But in Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet shall he, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And, um, and it is appointed unto man unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Not only did he go behind the veil, but he's coming back. Amen. One day the skies will unfold. He's coming back. He's going to split the curtains like he's going to split the clouds like a veil. He's coming back from behind that veil. That's what makes him a better, complete sacrifice. That's what makes him better. Not just the sacrifice he offered, but his ministry of being, he's still a high priest. The Bible says in in chapter 4, he's still a high priest. And he's still, we can still go before him as a high priest. He's still our high priest. He's still interceding for us. Think about that when God intercedes for us. We can pray for each other, but God intercedes for us. Christ intercedes for us. He is still a high priest. He's not completed. He's still doing the office of the high priest behind that veil. Every, his blood is perpetual. Is perpetual. The, the power of his, of his pardon is perpetual. Let's take that, Brother Jimenez. But in the power of his, the power of his, of his, um, of his offering is still perpetual offering. It still spe- his blood still speaks for us. It still speaks justified, forgiven, pardoned, forgiven, justified, pardoned. Forgiven, justified, pardoned. It still speaks to God for us. He, his blood still pleads on our behalf. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. But he became more. He, he, you know, the immortal, the God who cannot die, died. He did it for us. I'm glad the Word of God shows us that. This is just why He's just plain better. But look at the last one. We see this. We see the Holy Spirit's conviction. We see the Holy Spirit's conviction. Go to go to John chapter number three. Now, I know that this can be taken out of context, and people can take this term and run with it. They can take every term and run with it. Um, they, can run, they, can, they can go to the ends of the earth and go wrong with it. But here's the fact of the matter. No man comes to the Father except... No one comes to Christ except, except God draws him. That's the truth. Unless God draws him, no man comes to God. The Bible says that... Are, are you, we, should, we should be over in chapter 16, excuse me. John 16, I apologize. Without the Holy Spirit, we'll never be able to respond to the effectual call of God. The Holy Spirit is the one that draws us. The Holy Spirit of God is the one that convicts us, to let us know we need a Savior. How does that work? As the believers out there witnessing... We can witness to them to the blue in the face, but until God draws them, until the Holy Spirit convinces them, 
Well, at least they convict. We're, we're sledding them. The Holy Spirit lets us know, hey, you, you, he's right. Convincing. He's like, you, this is what's right. That, that what you, the Holy Spirit convinces the person as we're talking to them, like, this is true. You know this is true. We're all sinners. We're, you know, we need a Savior. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He's all over eternal life. That convincing is done by the Holy Spirit. That's the convincing. I understand some people believe this, you know, no conviction. I, well, no, people are wrong with it. Well, unless they're shaking and they're gripping the front pew, the death grip, and they've got tears running down their face, and they're crying, they can't get saved. That's not the conviction we're talking about. We, look, if that's how God's dealing with a person's heart because they, because, they, because they respond emotionally, you can't deny, you don't denounce that. Don't denounce that. But to expect that from every person, that's wrong. That's wrong. But we need to be convinced of the things of God. Look at chapter number 16, verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That is all what God does with convincing us of us. The, God, he, the Holy Spirit of God convinces the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, because we're sinners. Of, you know, we're, we're, we need a Savior. Of our judgment, we are going to face God one day. There is a, there is a, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. There is a heaven, there is a hell, and if you're not born again, you're going to hell. The Holy Spirit of God convinces that person, if, they, if, they're, if they'll listen to the Holy Spirit of God, they will hear that gospel and they'll believe on it. I believe, I, no, I don't, I'm going to say this and it's going to get me all messed up, but it's okay. I believe he that went of the souls is wise. I believe that he that went of the souls is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who wins the souls. Right. I believe that. But we're supposed to do our part being filled with the Holy Ghost and being the vessel he uses to, win, to witness. Right. I can't win a soul for Jesus. I can't win someone. I don't, we, go, we call it soul winning, but we're just being the vessel. We're just being the messenger. We're just being the host, the physical host to go and communicate with the lost and dying world. So I've heard, well, you know, I've heard Calvinists say that. Well, he that wins souls is what? It's the Holy Spirit. Well, yes, the Holy Spirit does win souls. But hello, genius, the Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says to go you therefore. So you can't excuse those things from it. But in John 16, the Holy Spirit's going to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Without the Holy Spirit of God, the world will never respond to the effectual call of God. God has been calling from, from creation. He's been calling for man, for man to believe him. From, the, from creation, without the Holy Spirit of God, they will never see God as holy, and they'll never see us as the sinner and in the wrong. They'll never see themselves as sinners and in the wrong unless the Holy Spirit of God shows them that. We can show them to the blue in the face. You've been there. I've been there. I was there yesterday with this woman, showing her from the gospel, showing her from the Bible that she needed to trust Christ. And she came to the place and she says, No. It, it tears me up. It makes me mad. Well, just get over it. You know, I remember when I was in sales, you would say, well, if you're, having, if you're, if you're upset because you didn't close on a sale and you're, and you're kicking yourself, you can't get over it. It's because you're not, you're not selling enough. Well, can I tell you that may be true in sales, but it's not the same thing as soul winning. It drives me nuts. It'll drive me nuts the day I die when people give a clear presentation of the gospel and I'm as clear as can be and I'm as forthright from the Bible as I can be, crystal clear, showing scripture, making it perfectly clear, they understand it and they reject God. I'll never understand that. But she understood fully that she was a sinner and that she needed to get saved, but she just would not come to Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God was, convinced, was convincing her of what I said was true. From the word of God, what was true. And she just would refuse to listen to it. The Bible says... And we're not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby we are sealed to the day of redemption. But how much more is it for a lost person to reject Christ? How much more is it for a lost person to reject Him? We'll never know the security of the transaction. Without the Holy Spirit of God, we'll never know the security of the transaction that God proffered through Christ. Jesus Christ, the Holy, Jesus Christ's payment for sin was satisfactory. In so much, the Bible says, we have the Holy Spirit of God that seals us. He is our earnest. We have the earnest of the Holy Spirit. We are His. Jesus Christ is coming back to redeem us. We are His. We are His possession. And we're still waiting for that day of redemption. We are saved as we're going to be spiritually. 
Amen? But physically, one day we're going to be, we're going to be spared from this world. We're going to be spared from, from what's going to happen. But we'll never know the secure. We will, without the Holy Spirit, we'll never know. He is our earnest. He is our down payment. He is our holding price. He holds us. He secures us. I just said down payment, and, I'm, and I, it was a slip of the tongue. Here's what happens. When I was, when I was younger, I, went, I used to go to the pawn shop and find cool deals. I'm not going to tell you what kind of deal I found one day. But um, I went to a pawn shop one day, and I went and I bought something. I went and bought a gun. It was a, a Ruger's 39... 39... No. SR9C, whatever it's called. I got a nice gun. 9 mil, pretty cool, extended clip, 17 mag, 17 clip. It was, it was nice. It was, you know, nice, nice grip. It was really nice. Top of the line. Dual safety, so I couldn't shoot myself in the foot like Barney Fife. It was really good. I paid for that gun up front. Paid all the money up front. But I didn't pick it up until three to four days, three days later when, the, when my um, background check cleared out. Right? So I left everything I had, and it stayed there for three days. Now, every day I would go by, I'd go and look at it. <laughs> kind of look at it, think about what it's going to feel like. The guy to hold it in my hand, pretty cool, but I couldn't take it with me until they got the security clearance done. So my, my background check cleared out. But it was mine. That was my gun. They couldn't sell my gun. They couldn't lose my, they couldn't give it to somebody else. They couldn't take it home. They couldn't, it was my gun. It was my gun. I purchased it. I had the receipt. It was mine. But I couldn't take it until, until the three days were over. Right? We are God's. We've been bought with a price. We've been purchased. We've been redeemed. We've been purchased. We're his. But until he comes and takes us out of this world, we're just, he gets to visit us. He gets to take us. We could, we could probably sleep in the store, pull up a cot. He could pull us. I could, I could have sat there eight hours a day, hold my gun, but I couldn't take it with me. The Bible says that we have, that he is our, he is, you are sealed into the day of redemption. So we're just waiting for him to take us out of this world, to take us out. And take us home. During that time, he's limited. During that time, he's limited to what he does with us. We limit him by how we act. We limit him by obedience. We limit him by what goes around us. We limit what God can do through us. But one day, he's going to redeem us out of this old sin cross world. After three days, amen. He's going to get us out of there. He's going to take us out. And we're his. But until then... The Holy Spirit of God is there. And he teaches us and he seals us. We can never lose it. The Holy Spirit is our receipt. My name is written on that tag. It's my gun. It was my gun. Now, what's stupid about the illustration is later on I sold the gun for cash. But um, <laughs> God will never do that to us, amen? But the whole, without the Holy Spirit of God, we'll never understand what Christ did for us. Without the Holy Spirit of God, we'll never understand what happened. But that's what the Bible tells us why we have the Holy Spirit of God. But we... Without, but that's that's what makes Christ a better a better um, high priest than Melchizedek. He offered a better sacrifice. It was eternal. It was once for all. It wasn't for his sins. It's for the sins of the whole world. He's coming back for us, and he's still ministering behind that veil. That high priest had to come back from behind that veil. He had to come back from behind that veil and minister daily offerings and his daily sacrifices. He had to do, he had to do that on his own for his own self. Christ. He's forever interceding for us. The Holy Spirit of God, He's forever interceding for us. So that's why I believe, that's why He's just playing out better. That's why, when we read, that's why when we read the Word of God, we find Christ is better than Melchizedek. He's holy, blameless, and not to be, not, you know, not, is not defiled with the things that we're defiled by. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted in all areas of life that we were, yet without sin. Aren't you glad for that? We have a holy, righteous high priest. You know, we get to tell that, we get to share that today. This Today, we go soul winning. This week as we're at work. You know, neighbors, people, friends at school, teachers. We're, we get to share that. We get to share that with our neighbors. We get to share the gospel with people. We, have a, we serve a risen Savior. We serve a better high priest. And it's not a matter of superiority. It's a matter of, hey, this is what he did for us. This is what we get to live for him. So that's all I have for you this morning. Let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and um, stand to our feet if you can. With head bows and eyes closed, I want to say this, this, no one's looking around, but say, Pastor, I know somebody that God has laid on my heart while you're preaching. God laid someone on my heart 
and I need to share the, I need to share the gospel this week with that person. The Lord's made it clear I've got to share the gospel with someone that with someone that I'm asking you to raise your hand. I'm just asking you if that's you today. Has God laid someone on your heart to witness to today? I hope so. I really do. I hope that's, I hope God lays someone lays a soul on everyone's heart. You know, be bold. You know, maybe maybe you've, maybe you've, God just kind of told you, hey, you need to get better at winning souls. You need to get more faithful to be winning souls and telling people about about what Christ did. Maybe that's what God wants. I don't know. But whatever, however it is that God wants, I encourage you to respond to what God has for you. My wife's going to simply play a couple of verses of invitation in just a minute, and uh, we'll we'll have it. We'll have a time of invitation. The Lord's spoken to your heart. Hey, do business with God in your seat at the altar. I don't care. Just do business with God. And we'll ask him to get the glory out of the service. Father, thank you for letting us um, glean from your word. Lord, I pray you take this simple message. Lord, apply it to our heart. Thank you for the word of God that teaches us. Lord, help us to not fail the open book test. Lord, we, we know that we're not saved by our works, but Lord, we're, we're justified before men by how we live. So Lord, I pray you'd help us to live as Christians. Lord, help us to share the gospel like we ought and give us boldness, Lord, as we go. As the piano begins to play, I pray that you just take this time and apply the message to your heart. Pray for that person. Pray for his souls today as we go soul winning. Pray for God to use you this week for him. Ask God for victory in your life. Maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe you're struggling with wrong attitude, with hurt feelings. Maybe you're, maybe you're struggling with, with just fears of failure. Maybe you got anger. 